Hello, everyone. Welcome to A Good Night for a Murder, a Victorian true crime podcast. My name is Kim, and as I'm sure you're aware, the holiday season is upon us. A favorite holiday and winter pastime for Victorians was telling ghost stories. Many Victorians wholeheartedly believed our deceased loved ones remained around us in spirit just as much as when they were alive. Many were also skeptical, but those who believed made it their mission to find proof. In tonight's story, we're going to talk about one man who, to some, provided concrete proof that our loved ones remained with us just beyond the veil. This is the story of spirit photographer William Mumbler. But first, Victorian Society tip. Victorians love to share a spooky fireside tale, especially during the winter months. If you yourself also enjoy a spooky fireside tale, odds are high that at least one or more story you've heard are inextricably linked to a big old Victorian house or antique object or some such. Why is it always Victorian ghosts? Why is it never a groovy 1960s ghost or an early 2000s ghost? If you get enough people to share their experiences, you'll definitely hear those types of ghost stories as well, but the Victorian ghosts do seem to be plentiful, don't they? That's why tonight's tip is how to tell if you're being haunted by a Victorian ghost. So first, let's talk about overall signs that you are being haunted. Apartmenttherapy.com lists the following as typical signs of hauntings. One, strange sounds. This can be knocking, footsteps, thumping, disembodied voices, doors creaking open, or anything else that sounds out of the ordinary. Two, object movement. Swear you left your keys by the door but found them on the other side of the room instead. Spirits will sometimes move objects to indicate their presence. Three, phantom smells. If you're catching whiffs of strange odors, whether it's perfume, tobacco, or unpleasant smells that don't seem to have a source, this may mean there's a ghost in your miss. Four, cold spots. In horror movies, sometimes you'll see people's breath to indicate a haunting, but in real life, it's not always this extreme. Feeling even subtle shifts or bursts of cold air can indicate a paranormal presence. This is believed to be because ghosts draw energy and take heat from the environment in which they are present. Other common signs of a haunting are recurring electrical problems, feelings of being watched, strange dreams, and, of course, seeing an apparition. If you've experienced any of this, you may be sharing your home with a ghost. But how do you know your ghost is a Victorian ghost? Well, we'll start with the obvious. Do you live in a big old Victorian house? Obviously, houses or even apartments with history dating back to the Victorian era, which is defined by the years Queen Victoria reigned from 1837 to 1901, are more likely to host Victorian ghosts. If you have an intelligent haunting, meaning you have a spirit that seems aware of you and the surroundings, it could be the ghost of someone tied to the house. Many paranormal experts also subscribe to the idea of residual hauntings, often referred to as stone tape theory. This is the idea that events can be recorded by the natural materials like stone or wood in the environments where they took place. Many Victorian buildings still bear remnants of their original construction materials, including brick and stonework, or floorboards and other woodwork. If you have one of these residual hauntings, you may see or hear the events almost like a replay of a video such as hearing footsteps on hardwood in an area which is now carpeted, or seeing someone regularly seated on the front porch. Even if you don't live in a Victorian-era house, consider the area you live in. Does your street date back to the Victorian era? Was it possibly a farm before it was developed? Now, if your house isn't Victorian and the history of the surrounding property isn't either, do you have any antiques in your home? Thrifting and scouring antique markets has become a popular pastime in recent years, and it's important not to overlook the possibility that you may have picked something up and brought it into your home that has some Victorian ghost energy attached to it. Now, while living in a Victorian house and collecting Victorian things are good indicators that your ghost is Victorian, the truth is, we don't really know how being a ghost works. Who knows why they wind up where they do sometimes. So, here are a few more tips on how to tell if your ghost is a Victorian one. First, is your electricity kind of funny? Arc lamps began replacing gaslight on the streets and in factories in the 1870s. The first functional incandescent lamps weren't introduced until the 1880s, and by 1925, only about half the homes in the U.S. had converted to electric light. And believe me, it was a big deal to have your home converted to electric light. Some even say that not converting their home to electric light and indoor plumbing was one of the motives Lizzie Borden had for murdering her father and stepmother in 1892. 
So if you have a Victorian ghost, you can bet they very well may be pretty infatuated with your electricity. Another sign you may have a Victorian ghost is phantom sense. In addition to the Victorian era being dark, it was also kind of stinky. Sores and waste disposal were not a thing yet. People worked all day in factories or on farms with livestock. And even though people of all classes did bathe and clean their clothes as much as they could, they still smelled sometimes. And for this reason, Victorians loved their perfumes. So if you have a Victorian ghost that is going to manifest itself through phantom scents, you may randomly smell things like floral perfumes. Violet, jasmine, lavender, rose, and honeysuckle were popular, as well as fragrant herbs such as marjoram, thyme, rosemary, and cloves. Likewise, you may catch a whiff of tobacco smoke. An analysis of 268 adults buried between 1843 and 1854 found that some disfigurement related to pipe smoking had occurred in about 92% of adults exhumed, while wear associated with habitual use of pipes was evident in nearly a quarter of them. The last tip I'm going to offer is that if you have noticed random trinkets or bits and bobs like jewelry or small personal care items and the like going missing, your ghost may be a Victorian one. Victorians were very concerned with outward appearances, so it's reasonable to think that their spirits are very attracted to the dozens and dozens of small shiny things we have in our homes today. What's more, if in life they did not have the means to own such things for themselves, they very well may be inclined to try to take them now. A nice pen, an earring, even a metal screw would be an object of fascination to someone from the Victorian era. People who experience this type of phenomena in their home are often advised to firmly speak out loud that you would like your property promptly returned. And it often works, because what are Victorians if not humbly polite? A Good Night for a Murder is a true crime podcast that does cover stories including death, violence, sexual assault, and other adult themes. Please take care while listening. Most stories about William Mumler start in the 1860s when Mumler was working as a silver engraver in Boston. They go on to talk about how a photography hobby led him to accidentally stumble upon the phenomena of spirit photography. But I'd like to walk that narrative back a bit. So far back, in fact, that William Mumler isn't even in the picture yet. I'm going to start the story by introducing you to Hannah Francis Green. Hannah was born in Marblehead, Massachusetts in 1832. In 1852, she married Thomas Miller Turner, with whom she had two children. By 1859, though, Miller had deserted his family. The same year, a Mrs. Stewart appeared in business directory listings as the proprietor of a hair work business on Washington Street in Boston. Hair work is the Victorian practice of creating mourning and commemorative jewelry or artwork out of the hair of deceased loved ones. If you've not heard of this before, it was common practice after a loved one died to cut a lock of hair from their head and bring it to the hair work artist. They would then weave the hair into braids and patterns that would be worn in lockets or other jewelry, or even create flowers and other scenes to be mounted in a frame and displayed in memory of their loved one. Mrs. Stewart, though, was likely an alias used by Hannah Turner. About the same time, one Hannah Green also appeared in business directory listings as a clairvoyant physician. A clairvoyant physician was one who would use their gift of clairvoyance to diagnose medical ailments and use their gift to cure and alleviate said ailments, usually by channeling a spirit healer who would somehow take on or take away the patient's pain. I know, it all sounds very woo-woo. This type of service can still be found today, though, if you know where to look, but in the Victorian era, it was almost commonplace. You see, the spiritualist movement was at its peak in the mid to late 1800s. Recent advancements in science and technology were proving every day that things people had thought impossible were possible. Electricity and light out of nothing, sounds and voices transmitted over miles and miles by telegraph, microscopes revealing teeming colonies of cells, and new geological and archaeological discoveries, to name a few. It was a wild time to be alive. Plus, the Civil War had just ended. Beloved sons, brothers, fathers, and more had left home one day to fight and never returned. There were thousands and thousands of families left wondering what happened to their loved ones. And if science could do all these other things, why could it not tell them what happened to their loved ones as well? With all the death the country had just experienced, didn't it just make sense that if it was possible to reach out from beyond the grave, that some would do it? And didn't it just make sense that with the way we were learning new things every day, that someone would find some way to commune with our loved ones on the other side? 
By 1897, at least 8 million people across the U.S. and Europe thought so. That's how many members spiritualist churches and groups are said to have had. It was mostly comprised of well-educated members of society, too. The Society for Psychical Research was founded in 1882 and was made up of scholars whose intent was to conduct organized scholarly research into human experiences that challenge contemporary scientific models, namely hypnotism, disassociation, thought transference or telepathy, mediumship, Reichenbach phenomena, apparitions and haunted houses, and the physical phenomena associated with seances. All is to say that if one wanted to open a clairvoyant physician practice like Hannah did, that would have been the time to do it. So in 1860 or so, Hannah is operating a clairvoyant physician practice at one location, as well as running a hair work business under her alias of Mrs. Stewart at the address of 221 Washington Street. Also listed at the address of 221 Washington Street, along with Mrs. Stewart, is silver engraver William Mumler. By 1862, it seems Mrs. Stewart has moved her hair work business down the road to 258 Washington Street, and also expanded her business to include photography. In 1864, a few months after Hannah's divorce is finalized, Hannah married William Mumler. Now, we need to read between the lines of business and census records a bit here, but what it sounds like happened is, Hannah, for whatever reason, separated her clairvoyant practice and hair work and photography business by setting up the latter under the alias of Mrs. Stewart. She was a single mother who was technically still married after all. Perhaps she was worried about her estranged husband coming back and taking her earnings away. I'm sure she had her reasons. Anyway, it sounds like she met the likes of Mumler and likely entered into a relationship with him while she was still technically married. Their businesses did share the same address for a couple of years after all. But once her divorce cleared, she and Mumler were married. Nowadays, most sources I came across begin their story by stating that Mumler spontaneously discovered spirit photography by accident. Some mention Hannah in passing as a possible influence on her husband's work. But I'm willing to bet the addition of spirit photography to Hannah and Mumler's business portfolio was strategic, and that it was very well masterminded by Hannah. Mumler isn't known to have any spiritualist background after all. That was Hannah's role. And for Mumler to one day have just oops, stumbled upon spirit photography while fiddling around with the camera? No, his wife was the photographer. She did it, and not by accident. She was a very clever businesswoman. Her hair work, clairvoyant, and photography business, possibly post-mortem photography, all went hand in hand. Why not add spirit photography to the mix? So let's pick back up with our story here. In 1862, Mumler was working as an engraver and practicing amateur photography in his spare time. One day, while sitting for a self-portrait, he developed the plate to see the faint, ghostly image of a young girl standing beside him. Mumler claimed he was quite shocked by this, as he was very much alone when taking the photograph. Upon closer inspection, he believed he recognized the girl as his young cousin who had passed away nearly 12 years ago. Mumler showed the photo to a spiritualist friend who confirmed for him that he had most certainly captured a ghost. Spiritualist newspapers picked up the story, and shortly thereafter, the mainstream press as well. Soon, Mumler had clients lining up outside his studio at 258 Washington Street, the same address registered by Hannah for her photography work, for a chance to be photographed by William Mumler, spirit photographer. The portraits often showed the subject seated alone, but behind or next to them, there would be a faint translucent figure, sometimes with their hands resting on the subject's shoulders. Now, a spirit sighting was not always guaranteed. Mumler admitted he had no idea why this had suddenly started happening in his photographs, but so long as it was happening, he was happy to provide his services. It was said that his wife, Hannah, would speak with clients beforehand to tell them what to expect, and also after to help identify the spirit in question. For example, it was often the case the spirit of, say, an older woman would appear in the photo when the client was expecting or at least hoping to connect with their dead brother. Hannah might step in and use her mediumship abilities to help identify the person who came through in the photo as their great aunt, maybe. People from all walks of life turned up to Mumler's studio for their portrait. Grieving mothers desperate to see their young children once more, young widows who lost their new husbands to the war, elderly widowers who became shut in and recluse after the loss of their wives. For $10, which is about $300 in today's money, you could be assured that your loved one was not truly gone. In fact, they were right there beside you. Now, not everyone was so enamored and awestruck with Mumler's work. Photographers have been experimenting with double exposures and superimposed negatives for some time now and achieving the same ghostly effects that Mumler was. Many regarded him as a fraud, but no one could prove it. 
In 1862, a veteran photographer, James Wallace Black, had been hearing of the sensational William Mumler spear photographer for some time now. And he was fed up with it. He, like others, was tired of him preying on the vulnerable sensibilities of those in mourning. An acquaintance of Black's who had sat for Mumler brought his spear photo to Black and asked him if he could reproduce the results. Black admitted that he did not know exactly how Mumler was doing it but he decided to send his assistant, Horace Weston, on an undercover mission to find out. Mumler recognized Weston, but invited him in to sit for a photograph anyway. He took the photo, developed it, and to Weston's surprise, standing behind him in the photo was the likeness of his deceased father. Weston took the plate and reported back to his boss that he'd seen no difference in how Mumler captured the photo. Black sent Weston back to Mumler and asked if he himself might come to sit for a portrait. He would pay Mumler $50 for the sitting if so. Mumla told Weston to tell Black to come on down, anytime he was ready. That same day, Black presented himself at Mumler's studio. And Mumler welcomed him readily. He invited Black to inspect and even take apart his camera, though Black declined. He honestly did not think Mumler was smart enough to manipulate the inner workings of a camera to achieve his results. Black was seated, and Mumler presented him with the glass plate he intended to develop the portrait on. Black inspected it, cleaned it, and told Mumler that from that moment forward, he would not lose sight of that plate. Mumler agreed. He should not. Then, Mumler proceeded to take Mr. Black's picture. Black accompanied Mumler to the developing room, where he invited Black to complete the developing process himself. Black declined, though, stating that he'd rather not interfere with Mumler's developing process. To make sure he didn't take this as a compliment, though, he added, you are not smart enough to put anything on that negative without my detecting it. And Mumler agreed. There was no way he could compete with the knowledge of the experienced photographer. The two men watched as the photo appeared. The first shape to be made out was that of Black seated by the window. But then a second lighter form began to appear. Black's eyes grew wider by the second as the image that appeared before him showed his deceased father, who had died when he was only a boy of 13, leaning on his shoulders. The awestruck Mr. Black had no more questions for Mumler except, how much do I owe you? Mumler responded, not a cent, and sent the flummox Mr. Black on his way back up the road to his own studio. But for as many people who wanted to believe, there were just as many who remained skeptical. In one case, a young woman had the spirit of her deceased brother, whom she'd lost in the Civil War, revealed to her. Shortly thereafter, though, her brother returned home, alive and well. The woman doubled down, though, stating that that must have been an evil spirit masquerading as her brother in the photo. In another instance, a man recognized the spirit of his wife in the photo with him, except his wife was also alive and well. What's more, she herself had been photographed by Mumler only a short time prior. Highly suspicious. Realizing he may be painting himself into a bit of a corner, Mumler left Boston and opened a studio in New York City in 1869. In April of that year, though, he was arrested and put on trial for a fraud. Mumler's defense team brought forth a number of clients as witnesses, as well as other photographers. The prosecution furnished as many witnesses, including P.T. Barnum, the master showman of Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. As part of his testimony, Barnum had another photographer prepare a spirit photo of himself with Abraham Lincoln standing beside him in order to show how easy it was to produce such photos. But despite the prosecution presenting a number of techniques that could achieve the same results as Mumler, they were unable to prove that Mumler actually applied any of them. When all was said and done, no one can actually prove how Mumler did it. And so he was acquitted. After this, he moved back to Boston, but the trial had done irreparable damage to his reputation and his business dwindled pretty much into obscurity after that. He did have the opportunity, though, to photograph Mary Todd Lincoln, President Lincoln's widow, sometime between 1870 and 1872, though he claimed he did not know it was her. Mumler claimed that Mrs. Lincoln appeared at his studio under the alias of Mrs. Lindell, and when her photograph was developed, you could clearly see the ghost of Mr. Lincoln standing behind her. It was reported that Mrs. Lincoln took this as proof that her husband had remained firmly by her side in spirit all this time. Mumler eventually ceased to spear photography business, but he did go on to invent the Mumler process by which photos could be easily replicated and printed onto paper, revolutionizing the printing process. Despite this and his earlier success, he reportedly died nearly penniless in May of 1884 at the age of 51. He is buried in the Cambridge Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Less is known about Hannah Mumler from here on out, though it appears she stayed in Boston, seemingly having moved in with one of her now adult children. 
However, the businesswoman, she would continue to offer her services as a clairvoyant physician well after her husband's death. She died at the age of 79 or 80 and is buried in the Waterside Cemetery in Marblehead, Massachusetts. If I personally was around in the 1860s, I would 100% have sat for a spirit photograph. I am curious to know if you would have, though. If you head over to Instagram or YouTube at a goodnight for a murder, you can let me know there. I've posted some of William Mumler's spirit photos, including the famous Mary Todd Lincoln portrait, over on Instagram. You can also see the photos and source links on the episode blog on my website at a goodnightforamurder.com. While you're on the website, you can sign up for the Goodnight for a Murder newsletter. Each month, I send an episode roundup, reveal of next month's episodes, and other goodies like extra Victorian society tips, book recommendations, and more. For the bonus content for Housekeeper and Butler to your Patreons for this episode, I am going to tell you a classic Victorian ghost story. Listen through the outro music to hear a short preview of this Patreon bonus content. To subscribe to Patreon and learn more about the podcast, you can visit a goodnightforamurder.com. Also, follow me on Instagram, TikTok, or YouTube at a goodnight for a murder. Please rate and review and share with friends. Thank you for listening, and I will talk to you again soon. and to accompany episode 34 about William Mumler, we are going to do something a little different. In honor of the Victorian tradition of telling ghost stories at Christmas time, I'm going to tell you a classic Victorian ghost story. This will be a retelling in my own words. This story I've chosen is by Elizabeth Gaskell, and it first appeared in a special Christmas edition of the weekly periodical Household Words in 1852, which was edited by Charles Dickens. This is the old nurse's story. The old nurse who relates the old nurse's story to us is named Hester, and the story takes place when she was not so old, but hardly a girl of 18. She was only a student when one of the fine ladies in her town came to her school and asked the headmistress if any of her students would make a suitable nurse's maid, as she was soon expecting a baby. The lady's name was Mrs. Furnival, and the headmistress recommended Hester to her. Now, Mrs. Furnival would go on to hire Hester, and Hester would stay with the Furnival family for generations, going on to raise the children of the young baby whom she'd not even yet met. And this is who she's telling the story to as an old woman now, these small children gathered around her feet on a cold winter's afternoon. Back to Hester's meeting with Mrs. Furnival, though. Mrs. Furnival hires her right away and shortly thereafter gives birth to a beautiful baby girl they name Rosamond. And all is lovely. Miss Rosamond is a wonderful baby, adored by her mother. When Rosamond is about four or five, Mrs. Furnival found herself expecting another baby. But the family would soon be met with tragedy. Just before the baby was about to be born, Mr. Furnival returned home cold and soaked from a ride in the rain and was soon taken ill with a fever. He would not recover. And so poor little Miss Rosamond left.